good morning everyone like i will just uh, emphasize once more uh, regarding the papers it's also that uh, we, as matthew mentioned it's uh, these are academic papers so at times you may feel a little lost in some parts of the paper not all parts but just, but just read through all of it and trust me by the end of the course you'll be very comfortable in, in reading academic uh, articles so, so academic articles are not the natural way of speaking so, <laughs> so you you may find it a little awkward in the beginning but wait through it and and uh, it'll be fine so today we will uh, today and tomorrow we'll uh, discuss uh, qualitative methods and uh, today will be mostly i will be giving you examples of qualitative uh, methods and a bit on methodology and uh, tomorrow we will do an exercise which will accustomize you to what qualitative research is mostly focused on uh, analysis tomorrow so the presentation is is in four parts so first i will introduce which is the, the larger introduction of uh, qualitative methods then i will take an example because it's very difficult to go so i'll take an example of my own paper and my own research and, and elaborate and then i will briefly tell you a little bit about managing data recording and data ethics which are which you ought to know and then we will conclude so in between if there are any questions just unmute yourself and and ask or if you want some further explanation or if you want me to repeat the same point again just uh, ask so i have any of you uh, have any of you been uh, engaged in any form of qualitative research? What is qualitative research? So it's a very broad topic. So let me just get into with an example. Let's imagine that a government agency wants to demolish a slum and, and build new houses for them. And they have asked you as an expert in qualitative research to conduct a research to help this agency demolish the slum and build new houses. What are the kind of things you will ask? Or what, what will be the research that you will do? Number of uh, your colleague here uh, said uh, number. You will ask about number of houses and number of people. Very good. So there are there are multiple things you can do. To just as an uh, to outline the example, there are two main things which you must know. The first thing is how many households are there in the slums because you're providing houses. So usually, if there are I don't know 100 houses in the slums, you expect 100 houses to be built. But then there is also a, a question of what constitutes a household. How will you count? Because many a times in the slums, the spaces are quite cramped. So you might share a kitchen, you might share rooms. There are sometimes the same house used by one family during the day and another family during the night. Services are shared. So how do you define what is a household? So if you look at these two questions, how many households are there? You can do a quantitative research to understand because it's count to be very uh, you know basic uh, understanding of it. And what constitutes a household is a qualitative understanding because you really need to know from the people's perspective because you cannot really count. How do you count? So you have to go and understand it in a qualitative manner. Now going further, in general, this type of research which interprets is called interpretive research and in some countries it's also positivist uh, research. So basically there is a problem which you're trying to understand or solve. And then there is a critical research which actually questions the the question itself. So a critical research will not find out how many uh, households are there or how many, how to count the households. But rather, it will question, oh, why this? Why are you doing this project? What is the politics behind this project? Is it even working? In real life, uh, the, the critical and interpretive part is not very clear and most of the projects are in between the two. So this is important to understand this distinction because when you will go through your readings, you will see that some parts are critical, some parts are interpretive. So when we move further in a broad stage, if I have to, to, to define what qualitative research is, there is data production, which usually we call field work. We go to the field, collect data or produce data, and then we analyze. And these two are governed by the research question we have. And the research question that are being produced in the analysis is uh, dependent on the theory, which basically means engagement with the literature. So we have seen in the first two classes, we discussed the informality research. So always your research will be in response to either take the theory forward or to critique what already exists. So it's, it's not in vacuum. It's always in relation to other works being done or, 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 or being carried out now. Now, that being said, it's not a linear process. It's always a mix. So it does not mean when you are on, in the field collecting data, you don't read uh, papers anymore or you don't analyze the data. Being so it all goes at the, uh, in, in, a, in a cycle where you proceed with your field work and at some point you realize that, ah, okay, I need to change my research question because there's something far more important or interesting. So it's a, uh, like a cycle. We'll come to with an example on how this is a cycle. So the example which I'm going to present is uh, my own research on uh, momos. Momos are uh, dumplings, which you see in the picture here. It's basically a flower with a stuffing, which is steamed. 
and I study this, which is being sold as street food in Delhi. So on the uh, on your other side, you can see uh, a street vendors selling these uh, momos. So so it's basically concerned with this practice around these uh, momos and within the city of Delhi. Now, how did I start this research? Is that my own academic situation was that I was doing a PhD research on urban informality, and I had already chosen the city of Delhi. And other parts of my PhD research were fairly clear on what I was planning to do. And on a personal interest side, which is also very important when you uh, do research or when you develop a project, that I was eating momos for a long time and I was quite a, a fan of this particular item. And I was interested in street food as well. And then there was the third aspect of, of theoretical interest, that which always intrigued me was, which we have al already discussed uh, in the previous lecture, that the state produces informality which means by making vending illegal or difficult, the state pushes the vendors to continue to be informal. So I wanted to test this theoretical angle and see, is it really the state or what, what are the different nuances engaged with this particular theoretical position? Because when we say state or government, it's not one entity, it's very diffuse. So how does it work? How does it work when the police, which basically is an agent of the state, but takes bribe, how does it? So I wanted to understand the nuances of it. So these were the three positions from which I started the, the research. Now, where do I start? So obviously I search online and see what has been written. So I did not find much academic articles, which is not the case for most of the research. You'll find something or the other. And there were lots of newspapers, blogs, which were not very really comprehensive. So, so the idea was that, oh, I, I have to create my own data because it has not been researched and I have to investigate the process myself. Now that's uh, being said, if I have to do my own research, I have to ask a research question. I have shown you my interest and this is my theoretical interest. What would be the question that I would ask? Could you guess uh, what can I ask? Maybe we can wait for a minute so that you can think and you, you know the interest, you know the research. And if I have to put this as my theoretical base, what are the kind of questions that I would ask? So we'll wait here for uh, a minute and then we'll continue. Now, the, the research was about urban informality. And within that, I wanted to inquire the informal practices around the street food. So street food is very general, so I selected just the momos as a street food in which I which I explored further to to understand other uh, informal practices related to the, to the discussion, right? Should I move on? Now? Great, uh, thank you for participating. So, basically, my idea was to understand this process. So, I asked two questions: What does urban plan? How does urban planning operate with respect to street vending? practices. Now, I see, I, I state urban planning here because that is one of the agents or agencies of the state which I'm inquiring. And the second is how do street vendors operate in the city, which many of you have, have posed, how much do they, uh, uh, how much income do they make, are they happy with the job, or uh, uh, is it a stable uh, job or a sustainable job, or is it a placeholder uh, for something in the future? And what data to collect is the next question. So these are the questions to begin with. So. I think this becomes quite obvious that how does the planning operates? I have to look at planning reports. So what do they do? So in Delhi, that means uh, reading master plans. This is archival, so I just, it's online, I collect and read it myself. Then maybe the report is final. There are other things which are there which I can't understand from the final product. So I can go and uh, talk to the urban planners in the city group who are involved in these planning exercises. And the second question, it's again obvious, how do street vendors operate in the city? I have to ask the street vendor themselves, what do they do? Now, with this very broad understanding of, of what I want to do, I go to the field. So how do I start? How do I start collecting the data? How do I talk to the street vendor? Is that I arrive in Delhi. Now, to be honest, I had lived in Delhi for six, seven years before doing this research. So I know the city really well. But if you're going to do this in a newer city, you will read, need to read a little bit more about the city also. So I come to Delhi and I walk around and look for momos also. I walk in regular places, which I know. I go to different places and, and look for uh, momos very randomly. And then when I find one, I do a very casual talk from that larger understanding. I ask like, ah, where are the momos made? What time do you set up the stall? Very general questions. It's, it's almost like I'm making a conversation. There is no questionnaire, no record, nothing, just to get an idea of what is happening. Now this particular method where you, it's called bimbling, the, the, the word itself means just roaming uh, without a purpose. So you, you roam around without purpose to get a very superficial first layer to get to the depth of the, uh, the topic under study. So what I found out uh, during this bindling phase was that most of the momos are being made in this settlement called Chirag Delhi, and most sellers are very young men. 
So when you do the bingling, you also when you, when you when you have talked and you you come back home in the evening, you write down all your information, all the things which you have noticed, and then you start analyzing. And then remember the first thing which I told you that it's a, it's a circular process. So you come come back, write down, and then you analyze it. So I found these two things. Most members are being sold sold in Chirag Delhi. So Chirag Delhi is a settlement in the south of Delhi. This red dot over here, and uh, it's kind of it's almost a, a squarish settlement because it is uh, enclosed in a wall, and uh, most of the people I talked to were selling momos seem to be living there or producing their momos there. So, and if you go to the streets of Chirag Delhi, this is the, the street level view of the settlement. Now, of course, I, I realized that I have to go to Chirag Delhi to inquire more and get into more detail. So, of course, I end up in Chirag Delhi and do the same thing. So, I walk around, look for momo stalls. I do the casual talk for understanding what momos are made, uh, what timing do you set up. Here, I do two things. First is bimbling, which you have already seen, that I just roam around purpose, uh, without a specific uh, purpose in mind and talk to people and get the, the, the very superficial understanding of, of momos. Now that I have a specific settlement to study, I need to understand that settlement as well. This is where transect walk comes in. Now, what is a, a transect walk? Is basically, I look at the map of, of Chirag Delhi, the, the settlement I'm studying, and I look at what path can I take so that there is a large variation, a larger understanding of of the settlement. So think about it like this, in an ideal condition when I have all the time in the world and energy, I would like to walk through every street of Chirag Bindi to understand what is happening. Is that is it possible? Of course it is not possible. So what do I do? I select a sample of a path to walk to get a, a myself a, a customized to the, the settlement. So I took this map and looked around. Ah, okay, so there is, it's quite squarish, so there is a wall. So I want to see if the edge of the settlement varies in some sort because this is also the edge which faces to the rest of the city, so is it different? And then I take like almost like divided like two lines which goes through the center of the uh, the settlement and through some of the squares. So the the nodes which you see are square. Actually, they're squares in quite traditional sense uh, where people gather and and uh, meet. So it's a good place to stop there and talk to more people to understand the settlement. So I do the transect walk, and uh, of course during these processes I found out many more things. But for the sake of uh, this lecture, I'm extracting just one result. So that it, uh, the examples are clear. So I found out that momo makers were mostly tenants in Chiragi. So they don't own any of the houses. They rent the places they live. Now, moving on, I had to uh, investigate the practice of momos. So now I have found out that most momos, uh, people who sell momos live in Chiragi. And those who are in Chiragi rent the place. Now, I don't know much about what, how the, the, the momos are made. So next step, I move to talk to those who make momos to understand how these momos are made, what practices are involved in making the momo. So, of course, if I need to talk to the people on how things are done, I need to interview them. But a specific interview method which I choose is called semi-structured interview, which basically means I will have pointers. So if I, when I go to meet a person who is producing momos, I have like a list of 10 points, which are usually one word and can be held in my palm. So when I talk to this person, it's not like, okay, what is your age? What, it's not like a, a, a collection of data like that. It's a more conversation. And the points which I have, which is why it's called semi-structure, are the, are the ones if we, if we talk and I, at some point I realize they, I have to ask something else, I just go through my list and ask again. So it's more of a conversation which I strike so that the person whom I'm talking to can answer things more above and beyond the questions being asked. So if I ask you, for example, what is your age? You just uh, tell me your age and the conversation ends there. So you give me an answer to the question which is being asked. But if I ask you, oh, I came uh, to Florence last year, when did you come? So most probably you will not just say ah, December last year. You will say, oh, no, I came December, it was pandemic and this happened. And, and then we get into a conversation where I realize probably uh, you came before pandemic, you had an experience, you came after pandemic and another experience. So it's a conversation. So that has to be kept in mind because we are looking for qualitative data here. Now, the results which I found through this semi-structured interviews were the larger contours of momo making, how momos are made, what processes are involved, and life and work of uh, momo makers. So, uh, basically, I went and saw the entire production cycle of who are involved, what kind of uh, steps they go through, because although it's street food, it's made at a quite an industrial scale, a cottage industry, not a factory. But nonetheless, the tasks are divided. It's very factory like where a set of people does one thing, then it moves to the next stage. It's very linear in process. So I understand how it works. So when I say it's at an industrial scale, this is what I mean. Like it's, it's not a factory, it's still a, someone's house where they're making it. 
Now, I understood the larger contours of how momos are made. I saw how momos are made, but I still need to, to get a little bit more detail on why did you choose this to do this? What are the people you interact with? What skills do you need? If I know how to make momos, which I learned in the previous stage, can I set up a momo stall? If so, why not everyone set up a momo stall? Because it seems quite profitable. So the fieldwork was to participate in the work of the moment maker. So and hang out as they work during their work or during their leisure. So the general idea is that when I engage in a conversation, there are things which the person feels important and is being told to me. So when I ask you, oh, when did you come to Florence or how was it? You tell me things which you think will interest me. But there are many more things which you will not tell me. You're not lying, but you just don't feel you don't need to talk about it. But I, as a researcher, need to know a great deal about it. So what I do is I sit with them and, and say, okay, you're cutting the vegetable, I'll cut the vegetable. So now I'm not asking anything. I'm just talking to them sitting there and then say, no, 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 cut it uh, fine. Or, oh, no, don't, don't put so much because this, one, this particular vegetable is expensive. So we'll replace it with, we'll not put cabbage, we'll put onions. So you see how the economics is working. So the idea, the, the method which is being used here, the, the first one is called participant observation. So it's observation, but participant. So basically you participate in, you become the participant of the event. So when momos are being produced, you participate in the making of momos. That's you do the participant observation. And the second is called walk along. So basically once the momos are done, the person has to take it to the street to sell it. So what happens between the street? There are many things, there are bribes being paid, there are uh, transport being hired, there are things being negotiated, which, you, which will never come out while talking. So what you do is, oh, can I come with you? I'll help you load, unload. So you walk along with the person who's selling momos. So you see all the details, which usually are not told to you when you ask any question. So of course the results which came were the details of momo industry. And I realized something specific about housing condition. You know, again, emphasizing the point here, the results were much more. I'm just cherry picking them to make uh, give you an example. So the housing condition came up, which was peculiar because if you saw the, the, the pictures where they were making momos, it was someone's house. So it's a house, which is also a production center. So how does the quality of life change when your house is also a factory? How does it work? Is it better? Because of course you need to clean it because you're making food. You need to clean it more than a regular habitation place. But does that mean you have a better quality of life? So I need to understand this. And, and why is it that people are moving to Chirag Delhi to make momos? You can make anywhere else in Delhi. What, what is so special about this resettlement? So just to give an example of, of how, because uh, when, when you, collect the data, you also make these diagrams. So I understood there are three sets of, because you, you get the data and you analyze. So I understood there are three sets of, of workers. So there are owners whose house it is, which is being made. They are the ones who invested the capital, they manage the whole thing. Then there are permanent workers who live with the owners uh, because they go sell the momos and they come back at night. So it's kind of a right-hand person of the, the owner. And then there are a set of temporary workers who just uh, are on a daily wage basis. So now, both the temporary workers and the permanent workers have formal migration. You informally build skills to become an owner. The raw materials which are purchased are formally purchased, but then you have very informal access to the point of sale, the, the spot in the city where you establish your, where, where you put up your vending stall to sell the momos. While the customers who come, some of them have formal income, some of them have informal income. So the, the, the point which I'm trying to make is when you start to analyze and put it in a diagram, you realize uh, and you engage with the theory which you have, which we have discussed uh, last week, uh, for example, here we see the formal and informal as a mesh. So it's not, there is no formal sector and informal sector in the pure sense, but it always interacts with each other. There is, there was a discussion on habitat of the dispossessed, uh, which we discussed on how if people are poor, they don't have uh, means to, to access uh, formal employment, so they engage in informal employment. While here I see that the same actors practice formal formality and informality. So it's sort of like a choice rather than they being pushed into it because they are economically poor. So moving on. So the results uh, which I'm getting is that I, I get the details of the momo industry. I see there is something going on with the housing condition which I need to inquire. I started with the, the theoretical position that the state produces informality. And then with the data, I realized, no, there is, there is one more theoretical angle which I'm interested in, is the, is the mesh of formal and informal, how they interact. So I think you see how you start with one and then you change as you progress in the field. And then I move to see that, okay, there is something going on with the housing condition which I don't know. So I need to look into the, the housing sector. So what do I do? Of course, I talk to the house owners. Again, uh, it looks obvious, but uh, you have to make it clear. And then I have to trace the changes in the housing condition. So how was it, I don't know, 30 years before how the houses were, and now what happened to the houses? How do I do this? Is that 
The first thing is I do semi-structured interviews, which we had discussed in the previous session. So engage in a in a talk. But many a times you need to have something called a focus group discussion, which means you gather a group of people who are similar. In, in, in when I say similar, there is no definition of similar. It depends on the kind of information you want to extract. And then you engage in a discussion because if some if one person misses something, the other person will add to it. So in this case, what I wanted is I have the house plans, the current plan of a house. I wanted to discuss with the owners how it has changed. So I get the whole family, the owner, the, 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 the children, the wife, we all sit together, I put the plan. And then I say, oh, how did it change over the years? The son will say, oh, when I was a kid, there was an extra room here, which got demolished. And the wife will say, oh, no, the kitchen was smaller, so we wanted a bigger kitchen. And the husband will say, oh, yeah, because I did not have money, I did this. So you get into a discussion, again, focus group. What was the focus here? Not age, not gender. The focus was, it's a family who had lived in that house or used to live in that house. So they, they give, they recount the changes which has been made. So I understand over this period of, of time, this is, uh, I gave just the example of house owner, but I do the same with the renters. And uh, I ask people, who, who are running shops on how this area has changed. So I get the larger contours of the housing market. And then I get, uh, I understand the, the nuances of rental ownership. So just to give you one of the examples, I found out that this house, uh, this area used to have very traditional courtyard houses called Haveli. So there is a, the, the, the top, the, the full image on the bottom, you see a section. So there is a courtyard and rooms arranged around it. Then you go up and it can go two floors, three floors, not more than three floors. And what happened is this used to be a joint family. So joint family means uh, the, a couple, their children, and the children got married, their couple and their children. So it's a very extended family which used to live there, which was a usual practice uh, 20, 30 years ago in this area. And then that changed. People started moving into nuclear families, basically husband, wife, and children as one category. So when you have nuclear families, you don't want to live in a big house like this. So over a period of time, people divided it. So that's the, the four squares which you see. So for example, in this example, the, there were four sons and they were given to all these four sons. Now, if you get a part of this large house, you can't really live because there is one kitchen, there is one bathroom in the other corner. So it does not work as a unit in itself. So most people resorted to demolishing the Haveli and rebuilding a sort of a, a house which can be rented out. And from that rent, they can live somewhere else outside the city. So they started building, you know, like a typical uh, ground floor where they can have a shop which can be rented out. And on top floor, of course, it's a small plot. So it ends up being one bedroom house. So it is because of this kind of transformation in the housing, I realized that many of the people who were selling momos were moving in here. There were other reasons also because there's economies of agglomeration. So when there is enough number of people uh, doing a certain kind of business in a certain place, it makes sense to move to that place. So in a larger sense, if you are in, in fashion industry, would you rather be in Florence or in Milan? That's not changed. It's one hour, but if you have an office in, in Milan, you have better chances for surviving this business. So similarly, there is a uh, benefit in being in Chiragpilly because there were enough number of people doing uh, making momos, which also means there, are, there were enough services which were required by uh, the people who make momos. Now, just to, to summarize, uh, we talked about bimbling, which is walking around aimlessly with, a way, uh, with the aim of understanding very superficially a particular phenomenon. Then transact walk, which is to understand a phenomenon in a confined geographical location where you understand the settlement. Then there were semi-structured interviews where you talk to uh, the people with a, a very brief list of pointers where the interview need to be like a conversation rather than a question answer session. Here, the question is how many interviews? Any guesses? Uh, let's put it, it, it is for this particular, let's, let's make a guess for this particular uh, example of Momo vendors. If you were doing this uh, research, you have seen what methods I employed. If you were to to do the interviews, how many interviews will you contact? Just unpause yourself. Do so you can. Just unpause yourself, switch on your camera, and you can give me a number or a, a, a method which will let you decide on how many interviews would you have conducted. So, the the idea of having a sample is quite. Uh, different when it comes to quantitative and qualitative. So when you say 10% or distribute it accordingly, these are uh, sampling methods in quantitative research, which is also of course applicable in uh, qualitative research, but we need other means because the data is qualitative. The, the sampling method also changes quite a bit. So there are multiple means by which we can decide how many interviews to do. But one of the things which I find quite uh, useful in deciding is the, uh, the approach called theoretical saturation. So essentially, it means that you start talk, if I start talking to uh, the vendors of the momos, I start once, twice, try 10 interviews, 15 interviews. Then 
the 16th interview, if a person starts saying the same things which has been said before, I, I start to, okay, there is a repetition. 17, 18, the same, 19, the same, 20th, it's saying the same things which I have already been told to me, then I say, okay, there is a saturation here. So I stop. So for certain research, the sample can be 100. For certain other research, the sample can be 10. So it's not the number which matters in qualitative research. So few of the readings which you will do later, when you go through the methodology, some will have like 100. I think there is one reading which does 300, the sample, while some will have like 10, 15. So you see the difference in the number in the qualitative research is because of its theoretical saturation. Now, the... Okay. So, uh, Professor Lora pointed that I should explain why there is a saturation, is it? So, uh, the, the thing is, there could be multiple issues why people are giving the same answers. So, first is that there is nothing more to know. So, if I ask uh, how is the, uh, the geography class or the modular urban informality to every student, and then they say, yeah, it's okay, it's okay, it's not bad, uh, uh, it's not very good. And after a point, there are no more answers. It's either good or bad or okay. You see, I mean, I, I use this as an example, but in, in a qualitative sense, it will be a little bit more nuanced that, oh, I feel like coming every day to the class. I have to push myself to get to the class because I really have to do this project. Uh, so I have to go to the class. So it will be, answers will be like that, but then from that you will deduce. So that could be that there is not much more variations possible, or it could be just that you're not talking, you're only talking to a specific group of people. So if I, like the people who come to class, if I ask only them, they are physically stuck with me in the same place. And if I am the, taking the class and I'm asking them, they are a little bit like, okay, I have to see this guy tomorrow also, so I will just tell that it's good. You know, then I say, okay, two people are saying good, maybe it's good. So, so the, the saturation can come at multiple, uh, due to multiple reasons, and because of which is the sampling method uh, important as well. So there is, there are multiple sampling methods. I'll give you the references to, to the qualitative sampling method. Three things which would be interesting to discuss in the class. The first is snowball sampling, which becomes, Snowball sampling, or as many say, no sampling. It's, it's like a snowball. You just go from one to the other. So in, in bindling, in transect walk, when you walk and talk to people, you just go talk to whomever you meet. So sometimes there are 10 momo vendors, sometimes there is one. So it's just very random sampling. The second is purposeful sampling. So if I realize that, okay, I'm looking at the house and how the house have changed, and I have talked to all the owners, but I've never talked to renters. So I purposefully look for renters, or I purposefully look for renters who are making momos in the house. So it's like a purposeful sampling. And then the third is maximum variation sampling. This is again an important sampling method in qualitative. Is what you do is it's very much related to theoretical saturation. So what you do is you vary the sample, as the name suggests, you vary the sample to the maximum extent. So let's look at the example of housing condition. So uh, what are the possible variations? So either you can be the house owner or you can be the person renting the house. Either you can be male or female. So I don't know, maybe the experience changed, so I need to know this. Stuff. So I start doing the, the qualitative uh, interviews. Over a period of time, when I go on, I realize yeah, there is a difference between short time owners and a long time owner. So I have to see, did, I, did all the people I talk to are long time owners or are they short time owners? If not, I purposefully look for people who are short time owners or short time renters to, to fill this kind of a tick box, uh, uh, like a checker box, which is there. Then moving on, I realize uh, my research is about momos. So if people like momos, and some people don't like momos, their renting preference, does it change? I don't know. I, I need to talk to the owners who like momos and talk to the owners who don't like momos. And then over a period of time, I realized, ah, actually, it's not just owners and renters. There are sub-renters, people who rent from people who have already rented. So does their perception change? So this list can go on and on as you progress in the, in the research. So when you start, it's, it's fairly short, which you can think without actually going to the field. When you go to the field, the list expands and expands and it continues which comes back to the first diagram which we discussed that all the four parts goes in tandem and, and interact with each other at, this, at all the points. Then the fourth uh, method which we discussed was participant observation, where we discuss, uh, sit with the, the people who are doing and help them do the things. And in that process, we learn what is being done, then walk along, it's in the name. So we walk along with the person from one place to another. In this case, I walked along from the place of where momos were being made to the place where momos were being sold and hang out at the place where the momos are being sold to see how things are set up. And then focus group discussion where you group uh, uh, a certain set of very focused uh, people depending on the, the information you want. For example, in the, in the housing study, I wanted the owners or all the family members of the owner of the house to sit together and discuss with me on a plan on how the house have changed. So these are the six methods we discussed, but there is there are a lot more which you can read on your own. So if you have any questions regarding 
any of these methods specific or any of the questions which you think cannot be addressed to this uh, uh, these methods you can ask it now i'll give you like uh, 30 seconds to just uh, wrap your mind around i'll leave the list on and then if you have any questions you can ask or clarifications or i need to explain something more you can ask me uh, to explain with another example ah, okay so we'll have a, a one minute break then or we'll have a two minute break <laughs> So it's a comfort break as well, and you can see out of these six, what you understand and you did not understand, and you can ask uh, questions or examples regarding this. So now we have uh, looked at the basic uh, qualitative methods. Now I also want to introduce you to participatory research. Now participatory research is something which gets even deeper than the methods which we have uh, illustrated before. The example which I'm giving here uh, are, are not examples from the Momo research, but it was from, it is from a class which I conducted uh, in 2013. So it's quite uh, a time back for bachelor students on informal settlement. So of course, if, if uh, bachelor students can do, you can also do it. While uh, some of the examples it could be little restricted uh, at, the, at the moment because of the pandemic, but you'll get a general idea. So how do we get deeper into deeper understanding. I'll present three examples from the student's work. So you get a picture of it and then you can read more about it. So let's let's look at a question of in a slum, whether there are people everywhere, because a lot of people have been crammed in a really small space. How do you understand what are the space in the settlement that a person values? Because whichever place you, it's not like, uh, for example, in the city of Florence, if you hop between four plazas and three streets, you know, you see some places there are more people, some places are less, and much easier to understand now that there are no tourists and there are restrictions. But when the tourists come, every place people it's filled with people. How do you know which place is more important? So you cannot ask in Islam. You cannot walk. So how do you get to know the value of space? It's very qualitative understanding of it because how do you value space? If even if you ask the the question of what value do you have for the place, you, you don't understand what the value is. So it's something which is very emotional, which cannot be talked. Are got into. So for these kinds of research, you need to have um, participatory research. So any guess what could be done to understand this? Okay, so what the students did was participatory movie making. So what they arranged for digital cameras, I think five, five or six digital cameras, and gave it to the youth of the settlement, taught them how it worked. Everyone knows how easy it is to use digital camera. And then they shot the slum from their angle, which was compiled later. So you'll see it, the, the data which is being produced is not the numbers, it's not text, it's basically videos, which does not have any narrative. So the, the youth went, shot pictures, and it was compiled. So that made the students understand what spaces are valued by which age group, which kind of youth, and how the space is being used. Similarly, let's move on. Maybe all the three examples put together will make it clear. The second group uh, which was studying, like uh, the, the, which came out of their uh, participatory method was a perception of safety. So when you move to a settlement, which where children are roaming around everywhere, and if you have to understand how, what to what distance can the children move from their house without creating a panic in the parents? You cannot ask. If you ask a parent, how long will you let your uh, daughter out of the five meters? But in reality, it could be like 20. You never know because you, you feel protected. And sometimes it's not the distance. Sometimes it's okay in this direction, not okay in this direction because you think there are multiple factors to it. So what this group did, was a, a participatory crafts workshop. So it, it decided on a day, invited all the children to a crafts workshop where the students came with their material and uh, taught the kids how to draw, how to make crafts, and they made a big installation uh, collaboratively with the children of the uh, of the of the settlement. This was in Chirag Delhi uh, of the settlement and installed it. So when you see who all participated and who all were reluctant to participate, you see a formation, a spatial formation, which is very difficult to map when you ask people or when you observe. So this kind of participatory research is needed. And the third example is also interesting, is how, are the spaces gendered? So when you look at, again, in what we would call slums or settlements which are very jam-packed, you see everyone physically occupies the space. So when there is not much open space, you go to an open space, there's men, women, children, everyone in that space. So it's very difficult to observe, ask, and understand are the spaces gendered? Is there a gendered connotation to the space? So what this group did, is did a, a participatory fashion show for the buffaloes of the settlement. So these settlement had a lot of buffaloes, which were being taken care of by the women. So it's sort of in the initial interviews, what they understood was that the women own the buffaloes. 
maybe not legally, but everything decided what to feed, when to milk them, all these things are decided by the women. So they engaged with the women of the neighborhood to do a fashion show where every woman bring their own uh, uh, buffalo, watch them and put uh, you know, the scarves and stuff, and then they do kind of a competition. And these are the certificates which the winners get, and there was a price of bell and all those things. But when they did the event, women initially agreed, but refused to bring the buffaloes out in the open space. And then they had to engage with men of the same family who brought it out to the public space. So you realize that although women physically occupy the, the open space where the event was conducted, it was a man who had an upper hand in that space. So these kind of nuances, I'm simplifying the examples, but these are the kind of nuances that you get to participatory methods. And you have to be very creative in, in, in designing uh, the participatory methods. You cannot sit here and think about a settlement which have never been and design a participatory method. You have to go through the other six or more which we had discussed before to understand and then uh, go in. Now, we have done these uh, methods. What, what is the data we are talking about? It's not the numbers. We have never asked for the numbers. We have asked for things. How do we record this? So there are multiple ways. There are two ways in which you can look at it. Is the first one is called field diary. So bimbling, transit walk, participant observation, walk along, focus group discussion, participatory methods. It's something called a field diary where you note what has happened. And the interviews which you take, whether structured or unstructured or semi-structured, are interview notes. So both these documents are more or less the same. The thing with interview notes is because interview more generally has one person, it has the voice of that person much more present in the text, but field diary is like your personal diary. It's very specific to the field. So it's exactly like writing in a diary, which you usually is personal. So you write all what you feel during these kind of methods which you, which you follow. And as already has been mentioned in the class, you add maps, which are annotated, you add photos, you add drawings, you add, I don't know, visiting cards. In the Momo case, I added menus to these interview notes and field notes so that you have a larger understanding of what is happening. Now, what do you write when you, when you do this? Is that you have to do a systematic observation. You have to very systematically write everything. You have to comprehensively record what is happening. And while you do this, you continuously analyze the data and update the methods and the sample. Because you cannot decide everything in the beginning and then do it because it has to change because your understanding changes, your qualitative understanding changes, your, your uh, inquiry changes, your questions, your methods, your theory, everything is flexible. And then insert sketches, photos, diagrams as you move on. So sometimes you write the things, sometimes you, you draw the things, which gives more qualitative uh, impact. Uh, then also very, be very specific that you, uh, you, you write responses from the, the respondent. So some of the interviews, it is not possible in all the field works, uh, many uh, at times you can record the, the interview. So you go with a recording device. Uh, in, a, in, a, in COVID times, if you're doing the interviews online, you can just record like this lecture is being recorded. And then you transcribe it. But basically, it means you transform the audio or uh, media recording into text, which can be analyzed later, which is the text is easier to analyze because you can highlight and go back and very easily. Or you, some places, if you like my case with the Momos, if I went with a recording device, they will stop talking. So I had to talk to them, come out of the interview, and then very quickly write down all my notes. So it becomes interview notes. There, I remembered some of the quotes, but not everything what they said. Then always record time, location, physical setting of the observation. So when you enter the house, oh, okay, the interview connected at such and so time, the location is house number, this, 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 and the physical settings, oh, this person, I took an appointment, he was waiting for me, he cleaned, and he was, a chair was prepared, there was tea. So you see, you write all these observations, which may seem very mundane at the beginning, but when you do it for multiple interviews, there is a pattern which start to emerge and you see it. And use of language and connotation, because you need to understand the language very well. If you don't understand the language, you, you, you hire a research assistant who will understand the language. And you have to look at the, the nuances of the, the language. So if someone says, oh, did you like the class? And if the person goes, ah, yeah, I like the class. I cannot write down, I like the class. Because basically my body language said that I did not really like the class. So you have to be very careful of the use of the language and connotation. And also write down thoughts that provoked on you. So when the interview was going on, you thought of something, just write it down in the interview notes. And you have to write and draw, like uh, you mentioned in the class. So for example, this example is, I was studying Islam where uh, the settlement sinks a little bit because it's too close to a water body and the ground is not very stable. So every 10 years or something, because the house has sunk in the, uh, in the ground, they just make the roof of the house as the new ground floor and construct on top. So that is very difficult to explain if I had to write it. So I just took a photo. Okay, this is the street level, and this is the old ground floor level, now below the street level, and new ground floor. You see the construction, you see everything. It's very easy to understand. So make these notes for yourselves. And there are certain ethics. 
the entire chapter and ethics, but there are certain basic things which you have to understand is that you have to be very respectful of the respondents, their surroundings and their opinion. Sometimes their opinions might not match with the political leanings or opinions you have, but that does not mean you can be disrespectful to them. So it's a very professional setting which you are entering. It's not like your friend whom with whom you disagree and you can disagree on the face and be disrespectful, but you have to be very respectful to the people whom you are talking because you're taking their time and they are giving something to you. And explain the research to the respondent before starting. So you have to always explain, I'm doing a research on XYZ, that's why I'm talking to these people and that's why I contacted you. Can I talk to you? This is the larger research. It's also because if in the end they want to know more about your research, you can explain it to them. Then explain very well how the data will be used and their, their rights. So basically, initially they might agree, okay, I will talk to you. Five minutes down, they realize, okay, this is not what I thought. I don't want to talk. They can just say, I don't want to talk without any question asked. You can, you can leave it up to them. So they should know that they have the option to refuse, stop the interview at any point or refuse at any point during the, the interview. Or two days later, they realize, oh, I said something which I should not have said. They can contact you and ask you to delete the data. So these things should be told to them in the beginning. In some context, you, you get a signed agreement that I have told you. In some uh, context, it's verbal. Because some context, if you ask to sign, people get a little bit more worried. Fourth is anonymize all the data. So you write down the time, of course, time you don't anonymize, but you write down the house number, name of the person and everything. Once you have the data set, you anonymize it. So you change, if someone is called Akbar, you change it to Ali. After a point of time, you also forget. So there is no way, if I take your data, there is no way to track down who this person is. Because sometimes in, in, in formality research, people are engaged in very vulnerable jobs. And the data which you collect can be used against the very people. You know, okay, I have marked all the location of the Momo vendors. If someone in, uh, in the municipality gets it, remove them. So I don't know, I'm just saying. So be very careful and never share the details of the respondents. You may share the, the data, but anonymized data, but not with the details of the respondents. And if possible, in the end, after you analyze, share your results with the respondents. And this is what I found out. This is, these are the results. And how to analyze this way, this we will also do tomorrow with an exercise. So generally, most of the things boils down to the text. So you have a set of text which you have to read, reread in a continuous cycle. Not only one interview, but other interviews, observation, field notes, which you wrote. And then as you move on, you annotate your data and try to make a diagram. You see, ah, okay, this is this past portion is related to the interaction of informality and formality and this portion as well. And the same thing happens in four interviews later. I mark them as such and then I put them together and see how they make sense, make a diagram of it. To, you know, to, to give a, a funny example is how Sherlock Holmes work on a board with threads. So it's in an imaginary way, it's, 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 it's uh, more or less like that. Then write down the resu results, which is very important. You have to write down what you found out, explain the diagrams that you made. Step four is go back to step one again. So it's a continuous process of reading, rereading, annotating, finding out, writing the results, and then finding out that, okay, I need to look it through this angle, then going back to your, your uh, notes, reading it again. So it's a continuous cycle which, which happens. Now, the one question which I wanted to pose is COVID-19 and the pandemic. Now, the examples which you present, which I presented uh, on the MOMOs is from a paper which has already been published. But the research is not over. I'm still researching. Of course, I can't go back to Chirag Delhi. I cannot interview uh, uh, the people selling MOMOs because all their contact details have been deleted. Ethics, you have to anonymize them. So the only way for me to is go there and I can't go there, what do I do? So what I'm doing personally for, for this particular research on MOMOs is I'm looking at Twitter. So I'm looking at how people are talking about MOMOs and the city of Delhi on Twitter. And I may managed to get a, a set of qualitative data of 10 years on over a period of 10 years, what people have talked about and I'm and trying to analyze it. You may, on the other hand, look at newspaper, historical records, movies, social media, crowdsourcing of data, for example, photographs, Instagrams. You have to be very creative. So qualitative data, of course, the methods which we presented becomes a little problematic in light of the pandemic, but that does not mean you cannot do qualitative data. You, you cannot do qualitative research. You have to be much more creative than before because the problems are a little newer and different. Come back when you look at, to conclude, when you look at the research project, you have to ask yourself what interests you. But we discussed in the beginning why I was interested in MOMOs. What has been studied and written about it? What will I investigate? What data will I need to investigate it? How will I collect or produce the net data which is needed? How will I analyze the data? And what results will be produced? Will there be a project report? Will there be academic articles? Will there be policy recommendations? And these things move to the initial diagram which we worked on. So what interests you or what has been studied or written about it? You cannot give answers to these two questions unless there is some sort of initial work which you have done, initial reading which you have done, both on the general media about the, uh, the place or topic which you're studying, as well as the literature written on that particular topic. So you cannot do an informality research without reading what is written about informality. 
Then moving on, what will I investigate leads to research questions, which you formulate and reformulate. And this, these research questions also depend on the literature because it is a response to the theories or a, a, a taking forward of the theories which has already been discussed. What will I collect data and how will I produce this data at the production methods which will be used? Then the analysis of data and do the analysis. And of course, here the theory comes back again because what analysis is important and what is not, what makes a contribution or what adds to the already existing contribution, all these things depends on the literature which already exists. And the results which you will, there are multiple formats to it, is the output. And again, it goes back to the, uh, the theory and literature which. So at least some of which we discussed in the class, some of which you have read in the mandatory uh, readings, and most of which we will read in the third uh, part of this module. So if you look at this, it's basically the, the same diagram which uh, I started lecture, which you have the initial work, and then it is the, the data uh, collection, production analysis, theory, and research question, which goes in cycle. You start with data collection, go back to theory, change the research question, analyze, go back to the data. So it's never ending loop which goes on. And in between, you produce output. So of course, I had produced the academic article on Momos, but that doesn't did not stop the research. So the output comes and then you go on the research until it interests you. And then just to give you a rough time. Now, this was uh, the, the, the article which uh, I discussed here. The initial work took six months, which had a considerable amount of literature review and field work plan. Now, please note that this uh, is a result of my PhD work. So it's, it's, it's a like time may look longer than what would require for a master's work. Then the field work, I did it in two parts. One, is, one was six months and the second field work was two months. And the analysis took three months. And the first paper, uh, which I published, took one year after submitting. So the writing period is different. It's difficult to calculate because by like, the initial work and reading literature, I'm still writing in the field work, I'm writing in the analysis. I'm, so it's difficult to say when did I start writing. So the, the, the idea of putting the fourth point is that when you read the readings for the next section, keep in mind that it takes around one year, sometimes more, sometimes less. Some of the papers will have submitted and accepted dates written on them. Not all of them, some journals do that. So you have to understand it takes around one year to publish one article. So you have to give respect that time which the author has taken to write that paper in your effort to read it as well. Okay, so this is not anything hard and fast in terms of timing, but uh, I thought it would be a good idea for you to, to understand how much time it takes or how much time it took for me to do these things. Then there are some selected references uh, I made which you can look to. So first part is the introductory part. So methods in human geography, a guide for students doing research. It's a very good book because it's oriented towards students. So you can take it. The second key methods in geography is more like an encyclopedia, which you can take it from the library. And every time you hear about a method, you can just go and look at it. The third book, doing ethnography, because the, at least the orientation in which the class was conducted today was more ethnographic. So you can have a look at more details of how you conduct activities. How do you talk ethnography? How do you conduct ethnography? And the fourth is a classic example of qualitative evaluation of research methods, which again, it's quite useful for students, especially at the master level, so you can take it at, take a look at it. The second section is the visual and participatory method. So I have put two. The first one is visual methodologies, which will give you a broader outlook. And the second one is actually a paper, which is drawing together, which uh, comes from, again, links to the, the point raised in the class. So can we draw as a method? Of course, yeah, this paper talks about drawing as a method. Then the third section I put specifically because we are in the middle of a pandemic. A lot of work needs to be also based on the internet. So there are two books which were luckily published way before the pandemic start. Uh, one is virtual ethnography, and the other one is ethnography, basically internet plus ethnography. How do you do ethnography online? So you can look at these books. For those of you who want to get more, uh, uh, need to have more extended engagement with methods, these are some of the, uh, the, the, the other references which I think would be very useful. Uh, the first is qualitative methods and map making. So it basically takes uh, your geographers. Uh, it takes how map making can be used as a qualitative method. It's, it's again, uh, it's not a book. It's a, it's an academic article. Then there is a handbook on critical and indigenous methodologies. So basically, it critiques the the usual methodologies being used. So it's also very. But I would recommend that you read this book after you read the the, the classic text because it's a critique of that. So you need to know what is being critiqued. Then there are these three papers which came in Progress in Human Geography. It's a journal, one of the most respected journals in human geography, which talks very specific about the discipline. So it's called Qualitative Methods 1, 2, 3. So you can look at it, uh, uh, very cutting edge, 2018, 19, what uh, the leading figures in the field are talking about qualitative methods. And if you want to know more about how to write ethnographic field notes, I found this book quite interesting because it, there are not many books which talks about how to make notes. So this would be an interesting. But all these uh, four sets of literature are for extended engagement. So keep that in mind. Now that ends the, the, the lecture part of uh, this class. Now we'll move to the, the exercise 
which we will do tomorrow, but you have to do the work today as well. So what we will do is we will upload on the Moodle uh, three interview notes, and you will be familiar with the context of the interview notes because it is from the Momo research. And these are one or two page interview notes each, very easy to read. You can very quickly read through them. So read two, three times, and what you have to do is you have to extract five themes. So that has to be done before tomorrow's class. And write it down and we will discuss in class tomorrow. With the three interview notes, there are also there will also be an instruction sheet which will describe in detail what needs to be done. So if you have any questions, you can ask uh, Matthew. Do you